This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, we're going to look at um, question one from the uh, December 2013 paper F9 exam. So make sure you've got the question in front of you. And let's look first of all at the requirements. Uh, part A, calculate the net present value of the investment project in nominal terms and comment on its acceptability. Part B, calculate the net present value in real terms, comment on financial acceptability. And so, we can already see it's a fairly um, short question from a reading point of view. It's a fairly standard net present value. Uh, the big thing, of course, is knowing the difference between nominal terms and real terms. And we'll sort that out as we go through A and B. Uh, part C, it may only be six marks, but it's completely separate, really. Um, whether we find A and B, the arithmetic, easy or hard, Part C, explain ways in which we can be encouraged to achieve the objective of maximisation of share of the wealth. Well, again, we'll talk about it when we come to it, but that can be answered on its own. It's very much a, a textbook sort of question. So the only thing there is do make sure you've left time for Part C. Uh, it's often worthwhile putting down a few points, uh, part C first, before you do the arithmetic for A and B. Anyway, I'll do it in order. First of all, part A. Um, it says calculate the MPV in nominal terms. Well, remember, nominal terms, it means we look at the actual cash flows. There's inflation mentioned here, so we're going to have to inflate the, the cash flows to get the actual cash and we'll discount at the actual, uh, the nominal cost of capital. So I start reading it. Darn has undertaken market research at a cost of 200. Well, the market research is not relevant, and it is worth writing down. Make it clear that I'm ignoring it deliberately, not because I didn't know what to do. But the market research, it's not relevant. Uh, the reason being, it's a sunk cost, i.e. the money's already been spent. We're only interested in the extra cash flows, the future cash flows will be, if we do carry on with the machine. Well, they've given us the uh, sales revenue and the costs. It's got a life of four years. Uh, they are going to need inflating. It says they're before taking account of the inflation. The capital cost, two million. Um, zero scrap value, there's working capital. And there's tax, there's capital allowances, tax at 30%. And the nominal, the actual, the, re the money terms cost of capital, 12%. So let's make a start. Let's set it up as normal. Um, it's four years, so times zero, one, two, three, four. And remember, Duly space here for a fifth year when tax is a year in arrears we are going to need um, a time five uh, first of all the operating flows uh, well the sales revenue the work here of course we know in the first year 1250 but we need to inflate it so although I wouldn't show workings for all of them I think it is important to prove you know what you're doing. And so the sales revenue at time one, the end of the first year, it's 12.50 per the question, but because it's in a year's time, we'll inflate, multiply by 1.047 to add on the, the inflation, which gives us 1309. Do check my arithmetic. I'm not going to waste time um, going back and checking everything. I would if I'd done at the end of the exam. It's clear what I'm doing. If I make the odd arithmetic mistake, it's half a mark. I'm sorry, it's too bad. Before I go back to the table, though, at time two, and make sure you are clear here because some people uh, make a silly mistake. Without inflation, it's 2570. We are going to inflate, but this time 
we'd need to inflate for two years inflation, which means multiplying by 1.047 twice, or 1.047 squared. Uh, which I think gives me 2817. And similarly, it's quick enough time 3, 6890, 1.047 cubed for three years inflation, and time 4, 4530, 1.047 to the fourth for four years inflation. Sorry, so again, 1.047 cubed times 6890 gives me 7908. And at time 4, 4, I get 5444. So if I go back and put them in, 1309 and 2817. Time three and four, seven nine zero eight and five four four four. Uh, similarly, the costs time one five hundred, but one year's inflation time two a thousand, but two years inflation. Time three, 2,500 with three years inflation. And finally, time four, 1750 with four years inflation. Let's see if I can get these right. 500 times 1.047 is 524. Incidentally, I'm working to the nearest thousand. This is normally what the examiner uh, does. And that would certainly get me full marks. Time to 1096. Two, eight, six, nine. And finally, two, one, zero, three. Let's put those in five two four and one zero nine six. That times three and four, two eight six nine, two one zero three. And so the net operating cash flow at time one is seven eight five. At time two, one seven two one. At time three, five zero three nine. And at time four, three three four one. Um, Next, I'll deal with tax. Now, you should be aware there are actually two ways of dealing with the tax, but I think the quickest, the fastest, the safest, the easiest is the way I do in my lectures on here. That first of all, I'll work out the tax on the operating flows. For the minute, I'll ignore capital allowances. Um, we'll deal with the tax effect on them separately. So the tax on the operating flows is 30% tax. It's one year in arrears, so the time one income seven eight five thirty per cent is two three six, but it's one year later at time two, and similarly seventeen twenty one at thirty per cent is five one six one year later five zero three nine thirty per cent one five one two a year later. And at time five, three three four one, thirty per cent is one zero zero two. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Now let's bring in the capital flows. We've got the original cost, it's two million, but remember we are working in thousands, so two thousand. And of course, there's no scrap proceeds here. Zero. So, no problem. However, because of the um, capital flows, we've got the, the tax saving on the capital allowances. And so let's turn to workings the capital allowance calculations here again very conventional it's 25% reducing balance and so we take the original cost which was 2000 the first capital allowance 25% will be 500 And therefore, um, we'll save tax at 30% of 150. And although there could sometimes be problems with the timing, normally, and certainly here in the absence of anything different, since the first tax payable is at time 2, we assume the first tax saving through capital allowances would also be at time two. Well, it's reducing balance, so the second capital allowance, 25% of 1,500, which is 375. And therefore the tax saving... One, one, three, a year later at time three. The third capital allowance, 25% of 1125, is 281. The saving, therefore, 84, at time 4. However, remember that on paper F9, although it's 25% each year, um, until the final year. So in the final year, and here it's a four-year project, so in the fourth year, remember we don't get 25%. In the fourth year, we simply subtract the sale proceeds, which here is zero, and we get all the remaining allowances. We get a balancing allowance of the difference. Of 8.44. And so the saving. 2.53 at time 5. So let's go back and put them in. 1.50, 1.1384 .1 and 2.53. Uh, 150, 113, 84, 253. Uh, finally, and I think really the only what you might call funny bit here is working capital. Remember, always leave this till the end because there's no tax effect on working capital. But what does it say here? It says the level of working capital investment at the start of each year is expected to be 10% of the sales revenue in that year. Well, a couple of things here. First of all, in the first year, we've got revenue of 1309. And we always assume the revenue itself occurs at the end of the first year, which is time one, one year from now. But we need the working capital at the start of the year and the start of the first year is now time zero and so at time zero we need 10 percent of the first year's revenue 10 percent of 1309 is 131 now where the 
tricks the wrong way that need to be careful of is at time two sorry at time one so in a year's time is the start of the second year we need 10 percent of the second year's revenue which is 2817 so we will need 282 but we've already got 131 we'll just need the difference so I will write that down and then hopefully it's clear but the working capital at time zero the start of the first year I know we've done it but it's 10% of the first year's revenue we needed 131 at time one which is the start of the second year we need 10% of the second year's revenue 2817 but we've already got 131 we need an extra 151 so an extra 151 we've now got the 282 we need what about time uh, two, which is the start of the third year? We need 10% of the third year's revenue. Uh, so we need 791, but we've already got 131 in the first year, 151 in the second. Sorry, time zero, time one. We need an extra. Oh dear, sorry, my calculator was switched off. 791 minus 131 minus 151. We need an extra 509. Now, I hope it's clear what's going on. Uh, uh, so doing the same thing uh, again. At the start of the fourth year, which is time three, we need 10% of 5444. Four, four. 544. Four. But we've already got 131 at time 0, another 151 at time 1, another 509 at time 2. Uh, and so. Here, we need less working capital. You know, the revenues fall and we need less working capital. So we'll actually get back 247. Now pause this bit and go back and think if you need. But if you add up 131, we put in 131, 151509, we've had back 247. The total we'll now have is 544. 10% of the fourth year's revenue. And finally, at time four, well, that's the end of the project. So then, as usual, we get back all the working capital that's been put in. So how much is there in there? We put in 131, 151, 509. We've had back 247. There's 544 left. We get that back. It's an inflow at time four. And so now we've got it. The net cash flow each year at time 0, 2, 1, 3, 1. At time 1, 6, 3, 4. At time 2, 1, 1, 2, 6. At time 3, Four eight eight three. I do hope you're checking these. And finally, at time five. So there are the uh, nominal cash flows. Uh, finally, the discounting, 
well here are the easy marks um, we're doing part A so we'll discount at the nominal the actual cost of capital of 12% so straight from the tables the discount factors 12% point Eight nine three point seven nine seven seven one two, and so the present values. giving a net present value and hopefully my arithmetic's right I have three nine four seven positive okay uh, finally for part A though whether you got the um, arithmetic completely right or made the odd mistake, make sure you didn't waste silly marks. It says calculate the MPV, which I've done, but it also says comment on the acceptability. And it may only be one or two marks, but you'd get these one or two marks for making a sensible comment on your figure, whether your answer was right or wrong. And the comment, which the main comment, of course, is that we will accept the project. Because it's a positive MPV. But it is subject, as always, to the accuracy of the estimates. All these figures were forecasts, and of course, if the forecasts are wrong, the MPV is wrong, maybe we shouldn't be accepting. Uh, but the particular problem here, although everything's estimated, the particular problem, the rate of inflation. You know, however well you forecast, how on earth do you know what the rate of inflation is going to be? 4.7%, but it could be anything. And of course, with different rates of inflation, the cash flows would be different. It would affect the cost of capital as well. With different rates of inflation, we could end up with a completely different answer. Anyway, that was part A. Let's move on to part B, which of course is exactly the same question, so we don't need as much time reading and as much working. Except this time we're doing it in real terms. And in real terms, well, we're simply going to ignore inflation completely. So the cash flows become, I hope, pretty quick. Now, first of all, the operating flows. Well, we've given these already in the absence of inflation. So, simply straight from the question, the sales revenue 1250, 2570, 6890, 4530. And similarly, the cost, straight from the question, 500, 1000, 2500, 1750 giving a net operating cash flow 750 1570 4390 uh, I hope my arithmetic's right there 2780 uh, the tax on the operating flows thirty per 
percent. Uh, thirty percent of seven fifty is two two five. Fifteen seventy thirty percent four seven one. The capital flows. Well, the original cost two thousand. The tax saving on capital allowances. Well, here we've done our workings already, and surely these won't change. The capital allowance flows twenty five per cent. Well, exactly as before. So there's no need to repeat one fifty one one three. Eighty four and two five three. So so far very quick. Um, slightly more work though the working capital. The approach is the same as before, but this time we're doing it on the um, sales revenue in the absence of inflation. However, because the approach is the same as before, I'm not going to write down all the workings. Do check me. At uh, time zero, the start of the first year, 10% of 1250, we need 125. At time one, the start of the second year, 10% of 2570, we need 257. We've already got 125. We need an extra 132. At time 2, the start of the third year, we need 10% of 6890, so we need 689. We've already got 125 and 132. An extra 432. Uh, at time 4, Four five thirty. So we need four. Sorry, at time three, I beg your pardon. The start of the fourth year, we need four five three. We've already got one two five one three two and four three two. So we'll get back two three six. And finally, at time four, we don't need any working capital. We get back everything we've paid in. We put in one two five, we put in one three two, we put in four three two, we got back two three six. We'll get back four five three. And so the net cash flow is Again, I do hope you're checking these figures. But equal, as I said before, because hopefully I've made it clear to any marker that I know what I'm doing. If there have been any um, arithmetic mistakes, it is only half a marker, so that's nothing to bother about. The main thing is setting it out in a way that we can easily check whether or not you know what you're doing. Finally, though, the discount factor... Oops. Here we do need slightly more work because we're taking a, a real terms approach here. So we've got the real cash flows in the absence of inflation. Similarly, though, we need the real cost of capital. We know the uh, nominal cost of capital is 12%. Well, we need to eliminate inflation. Uh, and this is the... Uh, Fisher formula on your formula sheet if 
I can find my formula sheet here we are we need to rearrange it uh, 1 plus R where R is the real cost of capital is 1 plus I over 1 plus H where I is the nominal the actual cost of capital which here is 12 percent 0.12 H is the inflation rate 4.7%.047, which gives me 1.0697. So R, the real cost of capital, is 0 0.0697 or 6.97%. 6 uh, strictly, we should be therefore discounting at 6.97. The examiner would never expect that. We'll use the tables and we'll discount at 7%. So the discounting itself, again, hopefully easy. The factors 0 0.935, 0 0.873, 816, 763, 713. The present values. One oh six three times eight seven three. Sorry about that. Giving a net present value. Of plus three nine seven six. Uh, and again, although that's most of the seven marks, don't waste marks in that you were also asked for a comment. And of course, again, the main comment is that we will accept because it's positive. But now I don't know how much you'd actually expect here because in total there are only seven marks, but it could be worth pointing out really two things. I think you should be aware from um, other lectures uh, that I've got on here that in theory whatever the rate of inflation is we've ignored it in part B but with the higher and higher inflation is the higher and higher the cash flows are but at the same time the higher and higher inflation is the higher the cost of capital will be and in a sense the net effect would be to cancel out and so in theory it'll mean we accept whatever the rate of inflation turns out to be but the big problem is it assumes all flows inflate at the same general rate. And the problem is, a couple of problems. First of all, the sales and the costs. Okay, they may inflate at the same rate, but there's no reason why they should. You could have in one inflating at a higher rate and one at a lower. Even if they did inflate at the same rate, one specific problem is the capital allowances. The capital allowance savings whatever happens, they will not inflate. 
Now, see, I'm probably writing too much here, and I'm not going to go on, except if you compare the two answers, in real terms, we got 3976. Um, in nominal terms, 3947. So they're very close, which is what I'd expect. And if it weren't for the capital alliances, in fact, they would have come to the same answer. But what's made them different is that whatever inflation happens to be, capital allowances, they will stay the same. Anyway, that's more than enough. Uh, finally, though, part C. Explain ways in which the directors, uh, directors can, be achieved to, blah, can be encouraged to achieve maximisation of shareholders' wealth. Now, this is a fairly textbook question. And so although it's not always hard to get full marks on a written you should be able to get a fair, well, easily pass marks here very quickly. Uh, two things before I write anything. The examine himself, remember, he always writes much more than he expects because he knows people learn from it. I'm not going to write a full answer here. It'll take too long and get boring. I'll speak it. Um, I'll speak the main points, but in the exam, Whereas I'll write a couple of bullet points here in the exam, I would actually try and turn them into sentences. But how do we encourage them? Well, the first, the main point you must make is it needs some sort of reward scheme. Uh, what I mean by that is it needs to, we somehow we need to link the pay to the performance. It's very much an F5 thing. Uh, but the way to encourage them is to make sure if they're performing well, they get paid more. If they're performing badly, they get uh, paid less, they suffer. Uh, the objective is to maximise shareholders' wealth. So I think the thing you need to stress, the main determination of shareholders' wealth is the value of the shares. We need the share price to go up. And so what you could do is have a bonus scheme. Link to the change in share price. If share price goes up. The more it goes up, the more bonus they'll get. Or more commonly, is perhaps to give the share... Uh, to give the director shares or share options give them shares and surely they'll want the value of their shares to increase share options you give them the right to buy shares at a future date now the only thing here <coughs> especially if you give them shares, you make sure they hold them for a period. What I'm getting at is if they can sell the shares at any time, then as soon as the price goes up, they'll sell. Uh, they're not worried about what might happen later. But if you tell them they've got to keep the shares for, let's say, five years, uh, it does force them to think long term. Now, those really are the main things to mention. Uh, it, there are other ways, of course. Shelters are, for instance, interested in profitability. So you could have a bonus scheme based on profitability. Uh, the only problem there, or the, the danger, is it's um, easily manipulated, or easy to manipulate profits. In the short term, what I'm getting at there is, if you know that your bonus depends on this year's profits, um, then there's a temptation 
to oh, delay some costs till next year, increase this year's profit, get a big bonus, there's the tendency to think short term, um, not encouraged to think long term. Well, I think that's enough, and that's certainly, uh, even if it didn't get me all six, it would certainly get me past marks. It'd get me quite good marks on that part. Um, I'm sure the examiner will have um, come up with some more points, but they certainly are the key ones. To have a reward scheme, link it to performance, uh, and particularly shareholders' wealth, link it to the share price. Okay, that's it for question one.